Hello everyone and welcome to Life Below the Surface presented by Kia. Today we're going to take you on a deeper dive into the health care of the animals here at Georgia Aquarium and learn more about the awesome people who take care of them. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our guest today. We have Dr. Tanya Klaus, who is the Vice President of Animal and Environmental Health and Nutrition. Did I get all that right? You got all that right. It's everything. Awesome. And Kristen. Kristen Jetsky, who is our Animal Health Coordinator. Ladies, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. We're really happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Very excited to have you guys here. And I thought before we kind of really dive in, I wanted to share just a quick, quick anecdote of a pretty amazing experience when it comes to kind of animal care and animal health that the three of us got to experience uh, now unbelievably about five years ago when we all were tasked with going down to ride out Hurricane Irma in Florida. Do you guys remember that, uh, remember that trip? Mem yes, remember it well. <laughs> I'll never forget, we were the only people on 75 South that was actually heading into Florida. Mm -hmm. It was nonstop traffic the other way, and we were the only people heading in that direction. And that was that one moment of, oh, we're doing something that's a little, a little crazy here. Mm -hmm. But it was all for the care of the animals. We were going down to an, an oceanarium called Marineland to help care for the animals as Hurricane Irma was making landfall. And one thing that really impressed me about the two of you and basically what, what you guys do for a living was that while we were there, uh, do you guys remember that beautiful pelican? Oh, yes. Yeah. Down on the bridge. Down on the bridge. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, do you actually, can you, I think I, one of my favorite memories is of you actually cradling the pelican. Do you mind sharing that story real quick of, of how we got to care for just this wild pelican that wasn't even part of the, uh, the animals that we were intending to go down and care for? Yeah, I think we, you know, got a call from a local that was actually probably driving out and said, you know, that they had seen this animal down on the bridge and asked if we could do anything. Um, so we went and checked it out, um, scooped him up in a towel. Um, Tanya gave him a quick overall exam, you know, just made sure everything was all right. I believe he had an injured wing. He did. Yep. Yeah. Injured wing. Um, and then we were actually able to be connected with a local wildlife rehabber that we were able to drop that pelican off with so that we could continue to do what we were doing. And he had a place to go for the hurricane and to recover. That's awesome. So we had dolphins to take care of, making sure the sharks and the turtles were OK. And then for the fact that you guys were able to, to take time out to go help this pelican. I'll never forget that. That was just a really cool moment and kind of that special little, um, you know, kind of that special moment from what was a Pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable experience. Irma was no joke. That was a Cat 3 hurricane, and we got to experience it quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Pretty crazy. So, well, cool. So with, with kind of all of that being said, let's kind of, uh, kind of go back to the start here. Um, so for, and this question is kind of for both of you, uh, but I'll start with you, Dr. Tanya. Where, where did your passion for, for animals, like, really start? How does someone get to become the vice president of Animal and Environmental Health and Nutrition? Great question. I'm not even sure how I got here still, I think. But um, my passion for animals started when I was a little kid. I'm definitely one of those people that, you know, I grew up in South Florida um, in the first half of my childhood. I was either on a boat or on a horse and had dogs, cats, birds, fish, you name it, all sorts of pets. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was about six years old when I told my parents I wanted to be a, an animal doctor because I was just fascinated with the care that our veterinarians for our pets and my horses and stuff uh, gave to the animals. And so I really just kept kind of on that path for a very long time. Like a lot of people changed my mind briefly in high school, thought maybe I want to go into computers. That changed pretty quick into college. Uh, and then my track went back to animals. Kind of always thought I wanted to be a large animal veterinarian with horses and cattle and that sort of stuff. But then I really found my passion with uh, aquatics and wildlife. And you know, some of the animals I work with are kind of big. So I still like to think of myself as a pretty large animal veterinarian, you know? I was gonna say, I, you, you, you're one of the very few people in this country, in this world, that can say that you care for the largest fish in the ocean. Absolutely. And when I was in vet school, that is not something that I ever thought I would say. So it's pretty cool to be able to say that. That's pretty awesome. And now, Kristen, basically the, the same question for you. How does someone get to become the animal health coordinator? Where did this all start for you? <laughs> um, it's a very long and twisted path. But, um, you know, I think like Tanya, as a kid, I grew up in Michigan, a little bit different, no ocean around me. 
but we grew up on the lakes and I thought to myself, you know, this would be really cool if these were oceans. Um, and by the age of eight, I told my dad, I want to be scuba certified. I don't care what it takes. Like, that's what I want for my 16th birthday. So he made it happen. Him and I both got scuba, scuba dive certified. And, um, you know, I, we started traveling. We started diving all over the world. I've been to Thailand and Mexico. And um, I think that passion never left. When I went to college, I, you know, studied marine biology and then kind of took a turn and decided that I didn't just like hanging out with animals and training them, that I'd rather do the vet side of things. It was way more fascinating learning the medicine and, and that stuff. So that's how I kind of ended up here in a roundabout way. Very cool. Very cool. So, and Chris, and I'll, I'll let you start kind of this one here. What, um, you know, you're talking about the medicine and, and all the animals here and, and all that. What is, what is a day to day look like for you? Ugh, day to day is very different, <laughs> right? Like we never know what's going to happen. Sure. We have our scheduled things, our routine exams and appointments, but, um, you know, these are animals at the end of the day. And so every day is different. Um, every day we have different things popping up that, you know, we get to experience and enjoy. We work with an amazing amount of different departments and teams that, you know, make this place function on a day to day. And it's, it's kind of amazing. That's awesome. And Dr. Tanya, same question for you. What does is, what is a, a day-to-day in the life look like for you? You know, for me, Josh, it's changed over time for sure. I mean, I can echo what Kristen said that for the animal health department in general, no day is typical. And that's a question we get all of the time. I've been here at Georgia Aquarium for about 17 and a half years now. And so early on, I was hands-on with the animals all the time, you know, literally sometimes 24 seven. Uh, now I get to work with three different departments as you mentioned at the start. And so I am doing a lot more people stuff and administrative type stuff. And, um, but just yesterday morning, I got to witness two amazing activities with animals, two different teams completely, but looking at 20 plus people coming together to make sure that we can orchestrate what we need to for animal health and animal care. So for me, I might get a call that, hey, I need you to come look at a dolphin, or we've got something going on with one of the whale sharks. I say to people now, oftentimes I, I don't get to do as much with the animals unless they're really big or really important or things like that. Um, but the same thing though, whether it's the people stuff or the animal stuff, no day is very typical and that's okay. Yeah, that's very much okay. And you actually just touched on something, um, which is kind of interesting for me because when, when people hear that you work at Georgia Aquarium, of, of course, one of the, the big iconic uh, you know, kind of entities here in the building is of course the whale sharks. Mm -hmm. So I actually get asked all the time, how do you take care of mm -hmm. a whale shark? I know that's a very open-ended question and it's, it's for either one of you, but um, you know, they are kind of that, they're in the amazing flagship exhibit of Ocean Voyager, the largest indoor aquarium in the Western Hemisphere. They're big, impressive animals. Uh, and yeah, can one of you kind of take us through, like, how do you care for a whale shark? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm gonna take us back a number of years. I'll never forget the day that I interviewed here at Georgia Aquarium. It was a December day in 2004. And that's when I learned that Georgia Aquarium was going to have whale sharks. And this habitat right here behind us didn't even have water in it at the time. And that day that I was here interviewing was the first day that they took all the scaffolding, all of the stuff out of the bottom of that habitat and started filling it. Now it took like four days, but I'm looking at this massive habitat before me and I've heard that the Georgia Aquarium is going to have whale sharks and I was dumbfounded. Now, of course, I didn't have the job yet, but I thought, man, that would be super cool. Well, fast forward to uh, sometime, you know, June or so of 2005, and I'm here, and I'm working at Georgia Aquarium, and the first whale sharks arrive, and I remember I had to get down in the box with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of our, our staff people was like, okay, help me get the stretcher under and that sort of thing. And I had one of those surreal moments of, like, there's a whale shark in my lap. I, and, and those were the first injections that I gave to the whale shark, just things to vitamins and things like that after its trip. 
how do you care for these animals? Well, they're fish, and we know how to care for fish really well. They are just a lot larger. And so we do all of the same types of things that we would for any of these other fish swimming behind us, even look at them and examine them and take care of them similar to dogs and cats. They're just a lot bigger and we've had to learn a lot more things about them. But I always say this, medicine's medicine, and especially for anything that has a vertebral column or a spine, yeah. right? And that's how they are. And so we approach it very much medicine's medicine, straightforward, and apply the principles that we know from all of these other amazing animals we get to work with. And if a problem comes up, we address it however we need to. Very, very cool. An, yeah, I work with an amazing team here, as you know, and that's what makes it all happen. Right. Well, uh, Kristen, do you have any uh, cool whale shark experience uh, that you like to share? I mean, I know you guys are, are you know, you're, you're, you're always here, you're always on call. For the even for the slightest thing, I mean, these animals are as well cared for as, as as possible. So, over your time here, is there anything from the whale sharks or ocean voyager you like to share? I think just the coolest thing is you know how they've trained them for blood draws and being able to swim alongside them, get the samples that you know the vet team needs for us. Um, you know, we give that all up to the aquarists that manage those animals. Um, they do an excellent job. They get us what we need so that we can monitor their health status, make sure they're healthy. Um, but yeah, just watching that team work with such a large fish and be able to train them to do what they do is, you know, absolutely amazing. And it speaks volumes for what we can do as a facility when we work together, for sure. Very, very cool. Speaking of cool, and this one's going to be for both of you again, and I know you've already kind of mentioned a couple, so I'm going to ask you to kind of dig down into the vault for this one here. What has been like the, the what's the coolest story that you can imagine? Like, I know you said you had a whale shark in your lap. Very few people, um, except for folks that work here, could probably <laughs> right. say that. Uh, that's a it's a really cool thing there. So, uh, Dr. Tanya, what's like? What's one of the coolest stories, memories, something over your 17 years here that kind of just pops out that you think people would want to, you know, wow. to hear about? You know, when I think about that, I really have had so many amazing opportunities here at Georgia Aquarium, and some of them with you know, such, such different animals. But I think some of the transport that I've been able to be a part of and watching the teamwork and the equipment and the logistics of those types of things are amazing. And so I've been on whale shark transports, manta ray transports, bel you, you name, belugas, everybody, sea otters. Um, two that stand out for me um, even I think just the complement of people and the things that we were doing, um, the transport of our manta ray Nandi from South Africa. Uh, that was something that no one else had done before, uh, moving a manta ray that far. Certainly we did that kind of thing with whale sharks too, but it was a trip with a lot of unknowns, not sure how it was gonna go on the other end. We were a little bit concerned about her in the midst of it, and of course, it all ended up okay. We'll probably see her swim behind us here in a few minutes. But it was very nerve-wracking, and it's the funniest thing because there is a picture that Jerry Harris and a few of our other colleagues here like to pick at me about, and they say I was napping, but I actually wasn't. It's a picture of me laying on top of the transport box in the airplane with a flashlight so I could look down on Nandi every little while. And I spent a very large portion of that 36 plus hour trip laying on top of a whale shark or a manta ray box um, watching her. And getting her to this side of things was probably one of the most phenomenal experiences I've had. Um, so, you know, and another one is moving sea otter pups from Monterey. Um, I don't think anybody quite realizes just how loud those cute little guys are until you're in a small plane with them. But uh, that was a, another one of those experiences where I was like, I'm flying on this private jet plane, moving these little cute fur balls to Georgia Aquarium so that they actually have an opportunity at life. And they wouldn't have otherwise because they would have had no place else to go. So those are, you know, every day is a cool experience, to be honest, but those are some of the things that really stick out in my mind, and a lot of it is because of the chances we were giving those animals and the opportunities to work with so many other departments and people and facilities. 
That's very cool. Chris, and we're going to get to yours in just a second. There's one thing that you mentioned that I kind of, uh, I'm even curious about uh, myself, and I'm sure our listeners are going to be. Can you kind of, uh, what was Nandi's story? I mean, South Africa to Atlanta, that, 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 there's quite a bit of distance to travel there, as you know. Yeah. And 36 hour flights, and you're mostly over ocean the entire time. Yep. Yeah. Um, what, what is, what is Nandi's story of, of, you know, how she came to be here? Well, it's, it, to make it a short story, if you will, Anandi, when she was probably in the first year of her life, because only about six and a half feet across, her wingspan, that is, uh, she was caught accidentally in the shark exclusion nets off of the coast of Durban, South Africa. Now, those shark exclusion nets are placed there by the Natal Sharks Board to keep people safe, to keep some of the larger toothy critters off of the shore and you know not in uh, close to the beach so that people can enjoy the ocean. Unfortunately, those nets can be very detrimental to anything that gets caught in them. And Nandi was one of those unfortunate critters, but fortunately for her, she was found in time. And so Ushaka Marine World in Durban was able to take her in, nurse her back to health, care for her, and she lived in their main habitat at their facility for a number of years. Um, but she was very, I, I think the best way to describe it is somewhat habituated. So she was very in tune to people, um, very aware of her surroundings, and because she had come into the uh, human care situation so young, there was a great deal of concern that if she were to be released right off of that coast of South Africa again, that she might end up in those nets, might get hooked accidentally by a fisherman or something, or travel north to other countries uh, up the coast of Africa that would consume her as a food item. And so they said, if you want to come get her, she can move to Georgia. And we were ecstatic, and we felt like we could give her an amazing opportunity. Um, so, you know, people ask me all the time, do you have a favorite animal that you work with? And I say, it's really hard to decide on a species because they're all pretty cool. But I will tell you that Nandi is one of my favorite animals and very close to my heart. And so she has a, um, a, a good ending to her story for sure, um, is one of our iconic animals, but it could have gone much differently. That's very cool. I feel like that's a, I feel like that's a whole nother podcast episode in the making there right. is just Absolutely. sharing Absolutely. rescue. I'm fascinated by it. So sorry for taking that little no, divergence there, but I, I've always wanted to kind of know her story a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And that's the most I've ever learned. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So um, with all that being said then too, Kristen, what's, what's one of your coolest memories are one of your coolest experiences that you can uh, remember besides for hanging out with me during a hurricane and rescuing a pelican which is i know probably the top three i mean who could beat that yeah. right? <laughs> for sure <laughs> um i think I, like tanya said like it's so hard to pick because we are so blessed by the environment we're surrounded in right um i think for me it, it is a lot like tanya um you know the first time we did a manta exam and we're sitting in a stretcher and i got a Manta on my lap, you know, you, when you, when you're in school or when you're going through, you know, the job world, you never think to yourself that like, I'm going to work with mantas one day and I'm going to be able to ultrasound them and measure them and get blood on them and have them sit in my lap while they get an exam. Like that's just not something that I ever thought of. Funny story is that when Georgia Aquarium was first opening, my grandma called me the day that they opened and she's back in Michigan. I'm at another aquarium and she says, you're gonna work there one day. And I was like, mm, maybe, but you know, like let's not hold our breaths. Well, she has since passed, but here I am working here. And to me, it means the world because my grandma knew, however, whatever way she knew, she knew that I'd end up here one day. So kind of feels like fate that I'm here and it's important to me. So, and I love the work that we do. Awesome, very cool. Um, all right, so one of the points of this podcast is to kind of give our listeners, to, to give visitors to the aquarium kind of a, a, a little bit of a behind the scenes, behind the scenes, of course, you know, I have to use that pun, behind the scenes look as well into basically how this place runs. You know, if, if you're a day-to-day -day visitor, you get to see all the galleries, you get to see all the animals, but there's so much more to, to, uh, to this aquarium. And one of the things that uh, I definitely want to know from, from the two of you is kind of, how about some untold stories from the ER. What's like a really 
random, weird, cool, bizarre medical procedure or something that you've been a part of. Um, in my animal uh, career, which spanned about 14 years, I was a part of some sea lion eye surgeries and, and uh, sonograms, things like that. Um, but I'm sure with you guys, it's probably a little bit more in depth and intense than that. So um, Dr. Tanya, what's, what's an untold story from the Georgia Aquarium ER that you can share? <laughs> well, one of them that I'm thinking about that wasn't what we would think about as an emergency case, um, you know, but it was a critical care case. And some of my classmates from vet school find this one very interesting. Um, and we're going back a number of years, but we had a Wobegong shark that had sustained an injury before it came to us here at Georgia Aquarium. It was having some difficulties. We weren't able to get him to eat on a routine basis, only intermittently, and he was getting a little dehydrated. Well, you know, Josh, a lot of times we have to be hands-on and, and, and handling these animals very frequently. So I wanted to come up with a way that we wouldn't have to handle him so frequently to give him nutrition, to give him hydration, that sort of stuff. And you know, will be gong sharks, they don't move around as much as a lot of these other ones that we see, they settle at times. So I decided, why don't we try putting in a stomach tube or a feeding tube for him? Something that we could just feed him without him really even knowing what was going on. So we brought him down to the surgical suite, we anesthetized him, and we put in a stomach tube, just like we would do in a dog or a cat or a turtle or something like that. So of course, some of the folks that I was working with that day were like, oh, have you done this before? I was like, well, no, not in a Wobegong for sure. I'm like, I've done it in some turtles and I had done it in a cat with assistance in veterinary school. And so we, I read the book, got out the small animal surgery book, kept it right there in our surgical suite downstairs read it as I went, put in a stomach tube, and it worked wonders. And we ended up suturing or, you know, sewing basically that uh, tube to his pectoral fin and then used this very large fluid line and attached it to a sponge on the top of the surface of the water so that the line would float. We could give him water, food, and he would never know the difference. He just knew that he got full. And we ended up making a huge difference for that animal. And I would do it all over again. But that was one of those things like nobody visiting here on the front side would know that that had ever happened. But to be able to say we put in a stomach tube and a wobbegong shark, um, that was a pretty cool thing to do. And yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. A couple things. <laughs> Sorry. A couple things you got to touch on there. Because I just love it how aquarium employees were so nonchalant about what, what's this like. Okay, so a wobbegong shark mm -hmm. that's in the largest indoor aquarium in the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. 100 yards, 6.3 million gallons, mm -hmm. and you just took him down to the surgical suite. Yep, that's right. Okay, so that's that's the first point. Mm -hmm. And the second point is you actually read a book and it wasn't a Google search. Ah, uh, well, you know, we're going back a number of years, so Dr. Google wasn't as popular. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I did. And had it right there in the surgical suite, so I had sterile hands and... I'd look over and make sure I was following it just like I ought to, and yeah, did the procedure. So a shark from the biggest habitat mm -hmm. is then taken down to a surgical. So you have a shark yeah. in a vet clinic. Absolutely, yep. And we had had him in our backup spaces for more intensive care, and then we moved him to a hospital system or a treatment system downstairs. And from there, when we needed to do the procedure and anesthetize him, uh, of course, the aquarist caught him up. We anesthetized him. We put him on a specialized surgical table for fish. And it's we call it a recirculating table. So the water circulates through the table. It has a grate on it. And that water goes down through the table. And we can recirculate that anesthesia in the water. Kind of like you or I would breathe in it, anesthesia in, in oxygen. Well, that's what we do with fish and sharks. and. Anybody who's a non-air breather, we put the anesthesia in the water, circulate that through. And then we did the procedure, and when we were done, we woke him up, watched him closely, put him back into his hospital system, and that's how it worked out. 
That's so cool. Okay, I can already tell that this one's going to become a two-parter. I want to have you guys back. These stories are fascinating. Um, okay, Kristen, it's your turn now. What's probably the an untold story from the ER or a, a weird procedure or something that you've been a part of uh, that just kind of sticks out in your brain? I think one of the coolest things that um, you know we we've done in the past, and we've done it a couple times now, is actually a C-section on a ray. Um, you know, in order to save the female Ray's life, you know, we needed to get the baby out. So, you know, we did a C-section right there in our surgical suite, saved both mom and pup's life, and both are thriving. So I think that those are the cool things. And we've had to do it a couple times. Sometimes, you know, just like in human medicine, those pups get too big for mom to, you know, do on her own. And we can, we have the ability to step in and make sure that both lives are saved. So I think it's cool. I don't think many people can say that they've done that. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> b- b- a wabi gong shark in a vet clinic and a C-section on a ray. Very yes, very few people. You're right. Very few people <laughs> can actually say that. I've never even heard that before. I think that's absolutely incredible. So, all right, guys. One last question, um, kind of here. Just just in talking to you both, you can tell how passionate you are about what about what you do. So, there's a lot of other. Uh, passionate folks out there, especially youngsters that are looking for what what they potentially would want to do career-wise, that love animals and things like that. Because not, not only does the work you guys do help our animals here, but it also has repercussions that span around the world with you know wild populations, things like that. As you said, medicine is medicine, and the more we learn, the more that can be shared in that community and the more can be benefited to uh, you know kind of the animals out there, which is very, very, uh, very attractive to some folks. I mean, that's a that's an awesome kind of career. So, what would be your your best advice to a potential vice president of animal health and nutrition? Uh, you know, what what would be your your best advice to you know kind of the next generation of of um, you know of, of what you guys do? Well, just for either one of you, go for it. From my perspective, for you know potential veterinarians of the future those people who are either coming up through high school or they're already in college and they're pre-vet, even the people that come to us as you know preceptors or veterinary externs. Um, the key thing to remember is that you can't just love animals. You have to wanna to work with people and you have to like medicine. Sometimes the things that we do aren't so happy or aren't so glamorous. So. I would never ever give up what I do, but there are times where it can take a mental toll. You think about coming here and working with some of these animals for 17 and a half years and working with their people, and that raises a lot of emotions too at times. And so you've got to take the good, the bad, and the ugly in this profession. But you have to like medicine, you have to have people skills, and you, you know, really to be in this kind of a job in the, the aquarium world um, or the zoo world, you have to be really dedicated, honestly, to conservation and making a difference more globally, as you mentioned. Um, but, you know, the bare bones of it are be dedicated to your education, get good grades, get as much experience with as many animals as you can early on. Don't hesitate to start volunteering in the veterinary world as you know, a kennel helper at a local clinic or even if you can come and volunteer at the Georgia Aquarium when you are young, when you are in high school and work your way on up. Because you don't want to go through all of the years of education to be a veterinary technician or now as some call it a veterinary nurse or a veterinarian and find out that it wasn't really what your passion was for or that it was maybe too hard emotionally or physically to deal with. Gotcha, very cool. All right, Kristen, what is your advice to future animal health coordinators out there? Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that I have lived by is um, do what you love, love what you do. Um, for sure. And I think that that has driven me to where I am today. You know, I it wasn't a straight line to get here. Um, you know, I think that somewhere down the line, you know, I got a little disconnected, but I didn't give up. Um, you know, I still found a way to get back to what I loved. And um, I think that if you can do that, like Tanya said, volunteering and 
figuring out what exactly it is that you love because when you first get into whatever field you get into, you may realize that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a little in, going in the wrong direction here and I need to take, you know, a U-turn and, and figure that out. So I think not giving up and just making sure that what you're actually doing is where your passion lies. For sure. Amazing. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. I definitely know we're going to have you guys back. I know there's so many more stories uh, that need to be told. I'm fascinated. So that, yeah, we're definitely going to have you guys back. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you hope you had a good time. Oh, absolutely. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you for having us. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you all for tuning in. And Dr. Tanya and Kristen, again, thank you so much for joining us. All right, guys, make sure you don't miss our next episode. We'll see you next time. This podcast is sponsored by Kia Motors. <laughs>